Christian nationalism has now become an epithet. Mm. So, oh, no, if you defend the free market, you're a Christian nationalist. If you're conservative politically, you're a Christian nationalist. And those are the people that stormed the, the Capitol. And those are the people who are a threat to our democracy. And as a philosopher, I'd say, hold on, calm down. Let's take this piece by piece. Let's tease this out, define terms, defend your views, and let's let's have a good conversation about these things. And typically you can't do that uh, on Facebook and tweets and Instagram and TikTok. Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and then proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And we're going to try to do that today with a tough topic. We're going to be discussing the fact that the streets of America were on fire in 2020. Why was that happening? And why does it still seem, even if it's just more of an ideological sense, why does it still seem like we're just on fire? We're going to be talking about that today with a special guest, but I want to let you know about a few things that are coming up. So this episode will be the final official podcast episode of the year. Now, this is the first time in the history of the podcast that we've actually taken a short hiatus, but we are going to not be putting out any episodes in the month of December. So I just want to kind of let you have that expectation right now. I'm actually getting ready to take a sabbatical for the last couple of weeks of November and on through the entire month of December and the first week of January, I'm going to be on a complete sabbatical where I'm not, hopefully, not going to be having to write anything or make any podcasts or I'm just, I'm going to read what I want to read. I'm going to just try to get refreshed in the Lord and uh, just really try to detach myself from all of this so that I can get filled up and come back in the new year with some really great content for you. We are going to have our first episode of the year. I already know what it is, so I'm going to tell you what you can look forward to. Um, on I believe it's January 8th. We're having Old Testament scholar uh, uh, John Mead and New Testament scholar Peter Gurry back on the show. And guys, we all loved their banter with each other. They're going to be responding to Bible TikToks and memes, and I can't wait. I'm so excited. I have all the memes and graphics ready to go, and there'll probably be some even better ones by the time we get there. But that will be a really fun episode where we have actual scholars that are responding to some of the things people are saying on TikTok about the Bible. So don't miss that. And I also want to let you know that if you want access to bonus content, uh, each episode, we do a little five to 10 minute episode with our guest. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers and look at the different tiers and see if you want to sign up to help support the ministry. And you can also get access, early access to episodes. And there's tiers where you can get a free book, just different things. You can go look there, patreon.com slash Alisa Childers. Okay, I want to get right into this topic today, because this is a tough topic. This is an emotionally charged topic for a lot of people. For a lot of people, this topic is really wrapped up in what we might be even perceiving as our identity, and there might be even some confusion about that stuff. So today, we're having, uh, who's becoming a regular on the podcast here, Dr. Doug Groitheis, who's professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary. He's just written a new book that I have not made, read the whole thing yet. I've made it about halfway through, and I told him before we went on the air I think this is possibly the most clear uh, explanation of all of the things we're seeing going on in our culture that would surround issues of social justice, race, unrest, the rioting that we saw. He makes the best sense so far, just making it very clear and understandable, helping us to make these connections of where our conversations seem to go south, when wires get crossed, even on what words mean when we're trying to talk with people. So the book is called Fire in the Streets. Now, I'm holding up a copy. He's going to hold up for you when I bring him on a copy with the actual cover. I'm I'm the kind of person that when I have a hardcover book, I take the dust jacket off because it just kind of gets in the way for me. And I accidentally left the dust jacket on a plane. So I have this. It looks nice, though, very sleek and black. Fire in the Streets by Doug Roy Tice. Um, definitely pick this up. This will be a very good, valuable resource to you. So, Doug, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time Thank to be you. with us and help us understand this topic. Forget. 
There it is. Yes. And and we have the, the graphic up there as well so people yeah, can see. Yeah. yeah. Fire in the streets. Okay. So for, first thing I'd like to ask you, I saw on Facebook maybe several months ago, maybe a year ago, when you started kind of talking about what was going on and you were talk, starting to talk about critical theory. And this was kind of the time that I was really becoming aware of what this was. And uh, then you began researching and writing the book. What was it that really kind of provoked you to say, I, I have to write this book right now? Well, I remember exactly when it was actually, I was asked to do a talk on this issue for a group in Europe. It was a Zoom talk. And during the question and answer time, it just came to me that People keep asking me about this. It's extremely important. I think there's a lot of confusions about it. And I, I said, even during the question and answer time, I need to write a book about this. And then the doors open and I was able to get Salem Media to publish the book and turn it around quickly because it's the kind of book that needed to get out there fairly soon after the main events that I was reflecting on. I was reflecting on really the riots of 2020, sometimes called the George Floyd, Floyd riots. And another key moment for me was in the summer of 2020 when my wife Kathleen and I were in Willow, Alaska. That's in rural Alaska. And we kept watching the news. And all these cities were aflame. There were millions upon millions of dollars of damage. Uh, law enforcement officers were attacked. People were killed. Looting was going on. And Kathleen and I really wondered if we should maybe hole up in Willow, Alaska for a few years because nobody was rioting up there. So I called several of my friends, several pastors and other folks and said, do you think it's safe to come back to Denver? Now, I never would have imagined even thinking such a thing before that. So I realized this was significant. And as a philosopher, I could talk about the philosophical roots of it. And as a Christian thinker, I could try to put it in a framework of a Christian worldview, look at American history and so on. Yeah, and I want to touch on American history in a bit, but I'd love to give our audience just an idea of what Marxism is and maybe how that has influenced America, because we hear that term thrown around a lot, Marxism, cultural Marxism. It's one of those terms that often people aren't rooting it in its historical definition of what it actually was and meant. And they kind of use it as a pejorative to anything they might disagree with or something like that. So let's define it. Talk to us about what Marxism actually is and how it's influenced America. Right. Well, this came up because the ideology that really informed the 2020 riots and informs the far left on matters of race is called critical race theory. And this is rooted in Marxism. It's sometimes called cultural Marxism. And I'm finding that a lot of younger people really don't know what Marxism is. They just have this very rosy view of socialism. And they think that America is a systemically oppressive society. And socialism would bring betterment. And if it takes some violence to do it, then let's just go with it. But Marxism is an atheistic philosophy. It's based on the thought of primarily Karl Marx and also Frederick Engels. And the idea is that there is no God, there's no supernatural, so we are defined entirely by material forces. And these forces are primarily economic. So it's a conflict worldview. The idea is that the essence of human history is the conflict between owners and workers, essentially. And when Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, they were saying that a revolution was brewing because the workers were so exploited by the owners that they would eventually realize their plight and engage in revolution against the owners or the bourgeois. And this would bring about eventually a much more fair society that exploitation would cease because there'd be no profit motive, there would be no private property and so on. Now, of course, this never happened. There were Marxist revolutions in Russia and China and elsewhere. But they never really proceeded the way Marx and Engels predicted. They were not led by the workers. They were not bottom-up movements. They were really top-down intellectual movements. And they wrought horrible oppression and death and torture in the USSR, in Maoist China, later in Cambodia under Pol Pot. Some people estimate 100 million people were killed by their own governments in the 20th century under Marxist regimes. 
So that alone should make you extremely skeptical that anything good is going to come out of Marxism. Mm. However, uh, there were some thinkers in the 20s and 30s in Germany, in Frankfurt, Germany, called the Frankfurt School, who said we need to update Marxism. We realize that what Marx and Engels predicted hasn't really happened. So we need to deepen the theory. We need to tell people they're not only economically oppressed, but they're oppressed in their identities. They are deceived by this whole capitalist system. So we have to expose it and try to foment the proper kind of revolution. And there was a key thinker on this by the name of Herbert Marcuse, who started out in Frankfurt, Germany, then went to the United States, ended up at UC Berkeley and wrote a number of influential books. His One of his great protégés was Angela Davis, the revolutionary in the 1960s African-American activist. And she, in fact, has been a mentor to several people in the Black Lives Matter leadership. So basically what happened is, in a nutshell, and it's hard for philosophers to put things in a nutshell to become <laughs> as big as a house, but I'll try. You have Marxism, utter failure philosophically, historically, and then people try to update it with something called critical theory. People like Herbert Marcuse and Eric Fromm and Max Horkheimer and others. It's still an atheistic philosophy. It's anti-American. It's anti-Christian. But the story is that America is systemically oppressive and racist and has to be undermined, not reformed, but completely undermined. And along the way, you have other thinkers being added to this, like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and others, and it becomes critical race theory. So the most important category, according to critical race theory, is not that you're an individual before God or that you're an American citizen or, of course, that you're a Christian. The ultimate category is race and gender. Yeah. So your race and your gender define who you are. And if you're non-white and non-heterosexual, then you are part of the oppressed class. You are systemically oppressed. And the only way to deal with systemic oppression is to completely overhaul the system. Mm. That's why it is a revolutionary perspective, not a reformist perspective. Now, I realize I'm asking you to, to guess motive here, but do you ever wonder if there's a reason why so many people now uh, would identify themselves with the LGBTQ and the growing alphabet that is coming? Because you know, if you think about it, if all you have to do is just identify yourself into that group, then you are now in the oppressed category, which gives mm -hmm. you benefits, right? And, and I'm not, of course, I'm not trying to make light of people's very real mm -hmm. struggles, because obviously that, that is part of it too. But we do see this phenomenon of like the rapid onset gender dysphoria and things like this. I, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's very bizarre. And what critical race theory has been able to do is incorporate gender minorities, you might say, or sexual minorities into the group that is supposedly systemically oppressed from the top down. And so you, all you have to do is identify as being part of this group. Now, you can't identify as being a member of another race. At least nobody's pulled that off yet. Right. A few people have tried and failed. But when it comes to gender, supposedly, that's fluid and self-defining. And you can simply identify yourself into an oppressed group. It's happening everywhere. It's happening rapidly um, in an unprecedented way. My book really deals more with uh, the racial, political, economic issues, not so much with the LGBTQ issue. I do have an article at the Christian Research Journal about that, and I do lecture about that. But it is part of it, because one of the things that Marcuse did was to say that it's not simply a matter of the owners oppressing the workers. It's also sexual repression. So liberation for Marcuse and his followers comes by utterly freeing yourself of any social conventions about sexuality. Freud had this idea of polymor polymorphous perversity. And Marcuse said, we need to jettison any kind of Judeo-Christian view on sexuality, any kind of restraint. So Marcuse is basically Marx meets Freud and then changes Freud to make him into a revolutionary figure. Freud basically said, we need to restrain ourselves sexually to some extent to have civilization. And Marcuse says, hang civilization. Civilization is just oppressive mm. in the West, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So we have to release all this erotic energy 
to fuel the revolution. Hmm. Wow. Well, and I also want to make a note for our audience here. Uh, we are going to have an episode in the new year with Monique Dusan from the Center for Biblical Unity, and she's going to help us understand more about the radical gender theory and how that intersects with CRT, because it's almost become uh, interchangeable in the sense that it's almost the same movement now. They have merged kind of into one, it seems. Doug, if I, I, I want to kind of bring this into the practical for people, because I think you know, there's a lot of words that are, they're, you know, talking about different philosophers and people in history that have contributed to this. And I think for the average person listening to this, they're thinking how, you know, I, I kind of see all this, but I can't quite get my hands around how to articulate what I'm seeing even happen within what people might even call evangelicalism. And we've done episodes on what's being called the evangelical deconstruction project, um, which, you know, David Gushy is quoted as saying, white evangelicalism is characterized by patriarchy, toxic masculinity, authoritarianism, nationalism, anti-gay sentiment, Islamophobia, and indifference to black people's lives and rights. Now, of course, a lot of Christians hearing that would take issue with saying that that's really what evangelicalism is about or even what Christianity is about, but often these labels get lobbed at people. And so I was uh, recently just doing some research, and I was noticing a tweet from Kristen Dumay, who wrote the book Jesus and John Wayne. And she was uh, she retweeted David Gashi, and she said, uh, Jacob Allen Cook shows quite powerfully that what white evangelicals have labeled the Christian worldview bears a striking resemblance to whiteness, that is, white-centered and white hegemonic ways of viewing and arranging the world and responding to human indifference. And I want to just say that there are some quotation marks in there. So she's obviously quoting uh, Jacob Allen Cook or whoever else, but she's basically saying she agrees with this idea that sometimes when we say biblical worldview, what a lot of people are hearing is, oh, you're just propping up whiteness. You're just promoting the, the white theology that is being used to control people and prop up systems of oppression. So I wonder if you might have some comments on that. Well, there's a lot to be said about that. That's neo-Marxist thinking. So it's trying to lump people together according to their race, as opposed to looking at the merits of ideas. Now, I dedicated my book, Fire in the Streets, to an African-American economist by the name of Thomas Sowell. And I quote a number of African-American thinkers. I think I quote Thomas Sowell the most, but also Shelby Steele and Walter Williams and Wilfred Riley and so on. I think the best way of looking at these issues of economic fairness and political opportunity and how do we deal with race in America is not through that lens. I think the better lens is to talk about the categories that we can ground in scripture. And that is, we're all made in the image and likeness of God. Everyone, we're all fallen. We're all east of Eden. We need redemption through Jesus Christ. There's one race, two genders, one savior, one Bible, which is the ultimate authority. And I don't want to approach ideas as white or black or yellow or red or green. I want to look at history and philosophy. And that's what I try to do in my book. So that description just clumped so many things together. Each one needs to be teased out and understood. Mm. Uh, what do we mean by patriarchy? What do we mean by uh, some of the other terms that were used? And I certainly don't identify with that uh, description myself at all. Right. Well, and I, I'd like to point out, too, that, you know, Dr. Groyteis is an egalitarian, Right. Is that, yeah. that's correct, right? Uh, so, you know, the, and, and I grew up in a denomination, it was the Foursquare Evangelical denomination that um, mm -hmm. had no, there was no position a woman couldn't hold, including senior pastor. Now, right. I've, you know, I, I've come to actually change my view on that. So you and I probably don't agree on all the, the aspects of that, but it just goes to show that you can't just lump people together because they're evangelicals or because they also happen to be white as promoting the same kinds of things. Like Doug and I agree, the Bible is the authority. Um, everything you said, I'm like, hallelujah, amen. That is exactly what unites us, right, in this one faith. And there are going to be some secondary issues that we might, you know, debate and have some issues about. But when I've noticed this, that in the deconstruction movement and in progressive Christianity, patriarchy is synonymous with complementarianism. So there's this charge that any church or Christian that would promote uh, any kind of complementarianism, even soft complementarianism, that's 
patriarchy, and of course, by patriarchy, they mean oppression. It, you know, it's not like rule of fathers, as it might have meant in, in the Old Testament or something like that. So it, it, it is an interesting thing. I love the way you worded that. Each one of those topics, Islamophobia, all of that, that all needs to be teased out, separated, yeah. because you can't just present this as a monolith. And certainly, we're going to find people that have errant views on these things, and there's going to be a spectrum of beliefs on other things. So um, I want to go a little further here. That, of course, was a tweet from Kristen Dumais, who wrote Jesus and John Wayne. Somebody went on Twitter, and I, I, we're going to show the, the graphics here. Uh, someone asked her, hey, Dr. Dume, do you have any tips on how the average person can analyze power and cultural systems so that we aren't held captive by them? And then he's talking about her book. Your book exposes what we've been experiencing, but I wonder if there's anything else we need in order to inhabit this time more wisely. Now, her response was very telling. She said, I should have a better answer, but for me, it wasn't one source, but years spent reading social and cultural histories, histories of gender, and then she lists some names, Foucault, Gramsci, Adorno, Habermas, and then she said, learning to be curious about how the world works. Now, some of those names people might recognize, of course, Michel Foucault, who is kind of known as one of the founders of postmodern philosophy in, you know, from the 60s, and then you have Antonio Gramsci, who's sometimes referred to as the father of neo-Marxism, if I'm correct about that. And then Theodore uh, Adorno, who's a leading member, was a leading member of the Frankfurt School, which from which right. critical theory came. So um, what do you think about that? Here we have a, a leader who identifies herself as an evangelical. Um, I believe, I think I'm right about this, that she also identifies herself as being reformed, but yet she's kind of leading this conversation saying, hey, these are some great sources to help you better analyze power and how to avoid error. Mm -hmm. Well, they're all Marxist or neo-Marxist sources, so they're grounded in an atheistic, materialistic worldview, and it doesn't mean you can find no wisdom from people like that. But uh, gosh, with Foucault, Foucault is probably the most overrated philosopher in the history of the world. Uh, he talked quite a bit about power and how power works to shape regimes of truth and so on. And I think we should have just learned that already from Francis Bacon, that knowledge is power. And there's a whole discipline called the sociology of knowledge that people like Peter Berger, Thomas Luckman, practiced very well. And uh, Foucault's basic view is anarchistic. He wants to destabilize all power relationships in order to let the libidinous self free. He himself was a, an open, active homosexual. He went to San Francisco for a fling at the end of his life. It ended up being the end of his life because he contracted AIDS. He was in favor of pedophilia. I can document that. Um, the book, uh, The Genesis of Gender, documents that by Favail, Abigail Favail. And Foucault has very little to offer a Christian in terms of understanding how power relationships work. His worldview is essentially wrong. Uh, the same is true for Gramsci. Gramsci was an Italian Marxist, another atheist. He is often credited as saying, we need to make a long march through the institutions to change society, to cause revolution. That was actually not him. It was a, a German university student, but it's definitely his idea. So I find that very odd uh, that someone who teaches at a Christian institution and identifies as a Christian saying that I get my basic categories for understanding society and power from these thinkers. Now, I don't know what Thomas Sowell's religious views are, whether he is a Christian or not, uh, but I've been reading him for 40 years. And if you want to see the Marxist balloon popped over and over and over again, all you have to do is read Thomas Sowell, uh, because he shows that all these analyses based on power relations and how power works with race and so on simply don't hold true to the facts. Uh, I read I started reading him about 40 years ago, and I've continued to read his books. He's written about 50 books. And when I read people like Foucault and Habermas and all the rest of it, it's really a lot of gobbledygook in a lot of ways. its I know I'm being very opinionated here, but I'm an old philosopher, so what else can I do? Um, it's not clear. It's not direct. It's not rooted in history. Like with Habermas, he just presupposes a Marxist worldview. 
never justifies it, applies it all over the place. Uh, Roger Scruton really took him down in his book, uh, Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands. So I certainly would not recommend reading those people for deep insights about how society works. I'd say read them because you need to understand intellectual history and the ideas of the day if God calls you to that. But I'd say uh, primarily uh, read the writers of the American founding, read the Federalist Papers, read the Constitution, read the Declaration of Independence, read some of these folks, read uh, Thomas Sowell's book, A Conflict of Visions. That's very profound. So I don't view Marxism as a neutral analytical tool, as James Cohn said, that you can apply as a Christian. I think the whole system is corrupt and has borne horrible fruit intellectually, culturally, and politically ever since, since its inception. Well, I'm glad you brought up the some of those doc, founding documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Federalist Papers. Uh, you know, even Martin Luther King called the Declaration of Independence, you know, the magnificent words of the Constitution in his famous I Have a Dream speech. So let's talk about America. Um, American history is a very confusing topic right now because, you know, when I was growing up, I learned that America became a nation in 1776. And before that was the, you know, the Mayflower and all that. And I got that that picture of history, but it's really being reframed right now. And there's kind of this new historical narrative, and that's being called the, the 1619 Project. So I'd like to parse through that, but let's organize our thoughts here. Let's start with uh, the traditional understanding of American history. Um, you, you write about this. You write about the founding fathers and the, and the founding documents. Give us a picture of, of that, and then we'll move into what the 1619 Project is trying to do. Well, there are basically two visions that are vying for the soul of America. One is you might call the 1619 vision, which is that America is corrupt from the beginning because of the presence of slavery. And certainly that's real and that's terrible. But the issue is what is America essentially about? Was the Declaration of Independence a fraudulent document because Jefferson owned slaves and because slavery had not been abolished in all of the colonies at that time and so on? No, America is based on the idea that all people are, all men are created equal and are given by their creator certain inalienable rights. And then we have a constitution that speaks of in the first amendment, the freedom of religion, of speech, of assembly, and so on. Now, of course, slavery existed, but slavery was defeated. Sadly, it took a terrible civil war, but even the constitution is really not pro-slavery. I deal with this in the book. I spent about five pages on it. There was a clause in the Constitution that talked about, in the southern states, the uh, it didn't use this phrase, but the enslaved people would only be represented as three-fifths the value of one person. And so we often hear that the Constitution says blacks are only worth three-fifths of a person. This is not true at all. This was a compromise between the North and the South. And the South wanted to have their slaves count as an entire person for representation in the legislature. They, they, of course, would not have given them the vote, but they wanted that to count as their total population so they could have more representation. And the North said, we don't want you to do that. So they worked out a compromise known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now, it's sad it had to even happen, but at that point, as I argue, you're either going to have one nation with a, a somewhat compromised constitution or you're going to have two nations, one free and one enslaved. But the Constitution itself is like a ticking time bomb against slavery. Frederick Douglass believed that. Great reformers like Martin Luther King talked about the magnificent documents of the Declaration and the Constitution. So I don't take the founding American documents to be fraudulent simply because people at that time had not lived up to the principles they had stated. So that's really crucial because the critical race theory approach is that America is racist from day one. It is systemically racist. And these documents are really meaningless as documents of freedom. They're just documents of white power. And I completely disagree with that. So I have uh, several chapters in the book related to that. I've got chapter three, what is America and should we burn it? Chapter four, America and systemic racism. 
And I try to go back to the documents and I don't try to whitewash American history. There's a lot of ugliness and a lot of discrimination. Chattel slavery was a horrible evil, but it was actually inconsistent with the founding values of our country. And over a long period of time, that was worked out to a large extent. And then we also had the civil rights movement, which put an end to Jim Crow official discrimination and so on. And we have a ways to go, but the way we have to go should be charted, I argue, by the founding principles of the country, not by trying to burn it all down, tear it all down, start over with some neo-Marxist agenda that has never worked anywhere and never will, because it's not true to reality. It's not true to human nature. It doesn't take seriously the effects of sin. It overvalues the power of politics. So that's my take on that. No, that's good, because that leads us into the idea of systemic racism. And you have the best analogy in here that really helped me understand what people are thinking when they use the phrase systemic racism. Because often, you know, you'll hear people say, is there systemic racism? And people will say, well, there are currently no laws on the books that discriminate against anyone because of the color of their skin. And if there is, let's let's talk about those. Let's get those fixed or whatever. But that's honestly, I don't think what a lot of people mean when they're saying systemic racism, because they're saying it's like everything, the after effects and everything that's that comes with it. And so I, I think you have a great uh, analogy here. You said, you know, people talk about systemic racism as unfairness to black people and other people of color take, is taken to be baked into the system. And so you say, interestingly, when something is baked in, that means it cannot be baked out. The only, like if you're making cake and you put sugar in there, you can't get the sugar out of it once you, you know, once you mix it up and bake it up. So you said the only remedy, according to this viewpoint, that it's baked in is to burn it to a crisp and start over with a new recipe. And so that, I think that is the the mindset of a lot of people maybe who who say America is systemically racism. It's not something you can fix with just changing some laws. We have to burn the thing down and start over. And so um, just would love you to comment on that, that idea of systemic racism. What's your approach to that? Well, it is a big topic. And the term is thrown around a lot without a lot of qualifications. But for some people, for example, Abraham X. Kendi, who's very popular, very influential in this area, He's come up with this idea of being an anti-racist. If there are any discrepancies of achievement between African-Americans and whites, and if whites are doing better at some level of achievement, like getting college degrees or higher level jobs, he says, because whites and blacks are equal, any discrepancy that disfavors blacks must be due to racism. And therefore, discrimination is required against white people in order to end this discrimination and bring equity. And I'm not denying that discrimination still occurs by no means, but that is really terrible social science. And all you have to do is is read a few pages of uh, Thomas Sowell or Walter Williams to see that because discrepancies of achievement are, are based in all kinds of reasons, like average age. The average age of a Japanese American in the United States is about 50. And the average age of a uh, African-American is in the 20s. I think it's 29 or something like that. Now, and also for whites, I think it's it's more in the 30s. I really should memorize what's in my own book. But <laughs> I, I, I feel there. that. I didn't, have, I didn't have the page marked, but you can find it there. Well, when you get older, all things being equal, you tend to have more income. I certainly have more income now than I had when I was in campus ministry when I was in my early 20s. So you have to look at things like average age. And also even things like where you were born. Thomas Sowell has argued convincingly that people in mountainous regions all around the world for hundreds of years have had more trouble achieving social goods than people not in mountainous regions. Think of Appalachia today. Mm -hmm. And Appalachia is largely white. So whenever people list a discrepancy and they immediately say racism is the cause, I have to say, let's do a little better social science here. Let's consider a lot of different factors. And also we've got to talk about sexual values, family values, work ethic, those kind of things. And I have a long quote in the book, may surprise people from Barack Obama, when he was running for president, he said, when we think about some of the problems in the African-American community, we have to talk about the lack of fathers at home. 
remember with that. Their children. Yeah. And that's a factor that no social program is going to fix. It has to be from the inside out. It has to be through properly understanding what it means to be a human being and being a father and being married and so on. So, yes, America was systemically racist, uh, even through the Jim Crow period. I don't think on a legal basis it is systemically racist now. Although black folks certainly have a lot of and other people of color have obstacles and concerns that I, as a white male, don't have to overcome. I had a great conversation a couple weeks ago in Louisiana with some African-American brothers and sisters, and I used the word colorblind in a positive way, and they challenged me a little bit. And I said, well, let me tell you what I mean. I mean that we should be a meritocracy, and we should look at people's achievements and possibilities and not make race a negative factor. That's what I meant by colorblind. And they said, well, when we hear colorblind, we hear that our black skin doesn't matter. Mm. I said, well, of course it matters. And I talked to them about ways that they think they've been discriminated against simply because they have black skin. I don't have black skin. That really helped me uh, get a better sense of this. So I think there's sometimes this either or thinking that you either buy in completely to systemic racism or you say racism doesn't exist and we can whitewash American history and not worry about differentials and achievement. By no means. But the issue is, what is the best system to give everybody a more fair opportunity in the United States? And I think it's uh, an essential conservative vision of a free market, a limited government, of uh, equal opportunities and admission policies and things like that. So you may disagree with my sense of what the politics should be to give people a, an equal opportunity, but it's not fair to say because I am not a hard left or neo-Marxist that I'm somehow uh, against black people or I'm not sensitive to racial concerns. So, yeah, now I would tend to agree with you on the the political, um, you know, ideals that you just articulated, but I wonder, you know, you mentioned free market and things like that. Have you been, where do you think the Christian nationalism conversation intersects with that? Because I find that even saying things like that, people will say, well, you're a Christian national or you're a white nationalist or something like that. So how do you approach that topic? Well, I'm just starting to really research the white nationalist movement or the, the Christian, rather, the Christian nationalist movement, because uh, there's a lot to it. And you have to ask some basic questions. First of all, the American creed is not white versus black or white versus anybody. The American creed is really in the Declaration and the Constitution. So I'm not here to defend whiteness. I'm here to defend humanity. <laughs> and the American vision, the American creed, as I understand it, right? But you might you might want to start out with some questions. Well, are you a Christian or not? Well, I am a Christian. Are you a nationalist or are you an internationalist? If that's the dichotomy, then I want to consider what's good for America, all Americans, not just white Americans, as opposed to what's good for the world in general, decided by the United Nations or some other global agency. So if you put it like that, I'd say, well, I'm a Christian and I want the best for my nation. And I, as a Christian citizen, given the First Amendment, have opportunities to influence civil government. And if I do so within the law, I can run for office, I can vote, I can support candidates, I can go to school board meetings, I can contribute books to libraries, I can write books trying to influence the common good. So I would like to see Christian principles have more of a say in the civil government of the United States. And given the Constitution, especially the First Amendment, I have every right to do so, as does every other Christian. But whiteness has nothing to do with it. The issue is being an American, being a citizen, being a Christian, and then trying to work for the common good or the welfare of the city, as Jeremiah 29 puts it. But I'm just starting to read some of the books that are coming out. And what do they mean by Christian nationalism? The way I laid it out may be different than the way some folks are laying it out. But I think that term, Christian nationalism, has now become an epithet. Mm. So, oh, no, if you defend the free market, you're a Christian nationalist. If you're conservative politically, you're a Christian nationalist. And those are the people that stormed the, the Capitol. And those are the people who are a threat to our democracy. And as a philosopher, I say, hold on, calm down. Let's take this piece by piece. Let's tease this out. 
define terms, defend your views, and let's let's have a good conversation about these things. And typically, you can't do that uh, on Facebook and tweets and Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, I, I'm boy. That is so true. I've I'm living in TikTok right now for research because I'm writing a book on deconstruction, and I really it's like ninety. I mean, this is anecdotal. I can't, I don't have stats for this, but it seems like like 90% of the deconstruction movement is happening on TikTok. And you Mm -hmm. can have somebody saying something that has almost a million views and and, and nobody knows the person's name. It's just, they've made some 27 second soundbite that makes Christians look stupid and people are sharing it and following it. So it's not, it's not like even necessarily a personality driven movement, it seems like, but it's just interesting mm-hmm. how people have gotten so accustomed to these really quick soundbite arguments and it's really inhibiting people's ability to say, whoa, okay, stop for a second and just tell me what that phrase means. I mean, even with deconstruction, one of the biggest challenges in writing the book is defining the word because people use it as this kind of catch-all term to mean everything from changing your mind on eschatology to becoming an atheist. And there's a lot in between there, right? So it's, uh, I think defining our terms is so important. I mean, even think about some of the terms that are related to this movement, like the term anti-racism, like who wouldn't want to be anti-racist, right? I want to be anti-racist, but then you realize, oh, this actually has an academic definition that's not really based on the traditional understanding of racism, which would be a personal prejudice against someone else because of the color of their skin or whatnot. It has to do more with the institutionalized or, uh, you know, the privilege plus power definition. And then it becomes this whole other thing. So I, I, I really appreciate you saying that about defining terms. So, Let's, uh, we're kind of getting to the end of our time here, but can you help us with maybe some ways the average Christian can engage with this? I think you modeled it really well just there, what you said about, uh, you know, nationalism. It's like, everybody, hold on, calm down. What do you mean? What's that phrase mean to, you know, what are, how are you defining that? And, but what are some maybe other ways that we can learn how to counter this in a constructive, in a, in a biblical way um, as Christians in this culture. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is developing good intellectual habits. In the book, I talk about how do we engage media, for example, how do we form judgments about situations such as George Floyd's death? What was the backstory? What really happened? Is it really indicative of the way uh, black men are typically treated by police officers, white police officers? And my, re- my research says, no, it was terrible and a lot of things went wrong. But you can't form a whole view of American society today on the basis of a video. You have to do some research. You have to look at some statistics. So I look at the work of Heather McDonald and Wilford Riley and other folks as a basis for how I view these things. But often we're given an image and then a storyline, and then we'll take it to the streets. And if you don't take it to the streets, you're racist, or you're a white nationalist, or something like that. So we need, I think, the intellectual habits and virtues of looking at issues carefully. And I have some some, uh, advice on that in the book about reading books about important topics, or when you go online, try to find a reputable news source Don't just take little blips from YouTube or Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, but try to find the larger context. And then, of course, desire to view this from a biblical perspective. I've got a chapter defending the biblical worldview in my book because I bring it to bear repeatedly on these issues. So we need to be prayerful and humble Uh, to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, as James tells us. But once we have some convictions about how to make the world better for the glory of God and the good of all American citizens, then we need to do some things. We shouldn't just sit back and do nothing. But I really worry about uninformed or misinformed activism Mm. uh, that is based more on adrenaline than intelligence and research, right? It's a terrible thing, actually, especially when it burns up city after city in America in 2020. Hmm. Well, that's wise advice. I know you've started a podcast, so tell us about that and tell us what it's called so people can find it. Yes, it should drop on November 21st of this year. It's called Truth Tribe, 
and it's on Salem Media. So right. we will be talking about apologetics, social issues, art, um, just whatever I want to talk about. For all. That's good. <laughs> I'll talk about what I want to talk about and see if anybody cares. So we'll see how that goes. But we have five episodes ready to go. Uh, the first, um, I guess actually six, the first five has to have to do with the Christian worldview and apologetics and theology of culture and biblical ethics and a little bit about my story. And they'll be probably 20 to 40 minutes long, usually. Okay. So the first awesome. one just got produced. I heard the first one a couple of days ago. I've got a nice little jazzy intro with drums and bass and Nice. So here we go. We'll see what yeah. happens. Oh, I'm so glad you're doing this. I remember a while back you were put on Facebook, you know, should I should I do a podcast? And I I, I think that's when I first messaged you, like, please do a podcast. I would I will be a listener of your podcast. So Great. Truth Tribe, yeah. everybody check that out. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Doug Groyteis, for joining me today. Don't forget to pick up his book, Fire in the Streets, and listen to his podcast, Truth Tribe. There was something I forgot to tell you all in the beginning, so I'm going to tell you now. I mentioned that I'm going on sabbatical. Uh, there will be a lot live stream on December 1st. And I'll probably go live on Instagram to announce this as well. Guys, I have a pretty fun announcement to make on December 1st. Um, I'm cooking up a few things uh, with uh, just a kind of a partner in crime, somebody else in the apologetics community. And we're going to be announcing a couple of really cool things that we're going to be starting and working on. So be, that will happen on YouTube. So you'll have to kind of go subscribe on YouTube. In fact, that's a good time to do that right now. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, click the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video, because when that live stream comes out, um, I, I think it's a pretty big, big deal what we're going to announce. I'm pretty excited about it. I, it's something that I'm, I feel very energized working on. So it's very exciting. Um, also, if you're listening on audio platforms like Google, Spotify, it so helps if you leave a five-star review. And when you listen to Doug's podcast, Truth Tribe, go on iTunes, leave a five-star review. That so helps you guys. It helps kind of beat those algorithms so that those, uh, episodes get put into the news feeds of more people. They get suggested to more people. So do that for Truth Tribe and for, uh, my podcast as well. And of course, if you're seeing this post on social media, you just see it go by, click like, make a little comment, share it on your social media platforms, really helps get the word out. So as we pursue Christ, remember, keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time.